In today's video, we're going to look at Putnam 2003 number A3, which is this interesting problem involving minimizing the absolute value of the sum of elementary trigonometric functions. So the question asks to minimize the absolute value of sine x plus cos x plus tan x plus cotangent x plus secant x plus cosecant x. So the strategy to start is to represent everything in terms of sines and cosines if possible. The first two terms are sine plus cosine. Then we get sine x over cosine x plus cosine x over sine x. And then subsequently we have 1 over sine x or so 1 over cosine x plus 1 over sine x. Now if we look at the middle two terms, if we put them in a common denominator, we'll get sine squared plus cosine squared over sine cosine. Now sine squared plus cosine squared is itself 1. So we'll be able to represent this as a reciprocal 1 over sine cosine. And similarly with the last two terms, putting them over a common denominator, we'll get sine x plus cos x over sine x cos x. Okay, so now we have everything in terms of sine and cosine. And you might think that a strategy with dealing with this is to go ahead and start using calculus ideas like differentiating. The thing is, we have two different things going on, a sum of the sine and cosine and the product. So it'd be nice if we can compactly combine both of those to express them in terms of, say, one compact trigonometric function or expression. And that's a strategy we're going to do by looking at sum and product angle formulas to compactify sine x cos x in terms of one angle and similarly write the result in terms of sine x cos x. So we'll start with the sine x plus cos x term first and think about writing it in terms of expanding cosine of pi over 4 minus x. Now the reason to do this is if we expand this we're going to get cosine pi over 4 cosine x plus sine pi over 4 sine x and sine of pi over 4 and cosine of pi over 4 are the same thing they're both 1 over root 2. So sine of x plus cosine x is actually a constant multiple times a trigonometric expression on one angle. It'll be root 2 times the cosine of pi over 4 minus x. Okay, so now it would be nice if somehow we could represent sine x cos x in terms of this one angle that we just introduced, the pi over 4 minus x. It's not clear necessarily how we're going to do that, but we can start by thinking about sine x cos x in terms of a double angle formula as being half sine 2x. Now, if we can shift sine 2x so that it's represented in terms of a cosine and hopefully in terms of this pi over 4 minus x angle, that would be really advantageous for us having everything in our absolute value expression in, expressed in one trigonometric expression. Okay, so we'll let y be pi over 4 minus x and then we'll think of multiplying y by 2 to get pi over 2 minus 2x since we have an expression involving sine of 2x. Now luckily, we can shift sine to a cosine and say that this is then going to be 1 half cosine 2y because 2y and 2x add up to pi over 2. So sine x cos x can be represented in terms of cosine of 2y and we have sine x plus cos x in terms of cos y. So this is really great. We now have that our function that we're dealing with inside of the absolute value has a nice compact trigonometric expression in terms of y. It's square root 2 times cosine y plus 1 over half cosine 2y and then plus their ratio because we have that cosine of y times root 2 in the numerator and then the half cosine 2y in the denominator. Great! So we're compactifying the thing that we're minimizing, or the thing inside of the absolute value we're minimizing, to handle this expression. Now we can take this even further by thinking about representing cosine 2y using a double angle formula in terms of cosine y itself. So if we let u be root 2 cosine y, 
we'll be able to represent cosine 2y in terms of u. And this will simplify the expression that we're dealing with even further. So this is the cool strategy we use here. Simplify things as much as possible, compactifying in terms of one trigonometric identity. Okay, so the denominator here will be half of, now cosine 2y is 2 cos squared y minus 1, and cos y itself is u over root 2. So we'll have the half the quantity 2 of u over root 2 squared minus 1 in that denominator, and we can make a similar substitution in the second fraction. We'll have u in the numerator, and the denominator half the quantity 2 of 2 times the square root, u over the square root of 2 squared minus 1. Okay, great. So now we have this function as represented in terms of this variable u. And u, the, the actual expression we're left with can be simplified even further by clearing out all the denominators and writing down the subsequent fractions. And we'll get in the end u plus 1 over half times the quantity u squared minus 1 plus u all over half times the square root of u minus, or u squared minus 1. And here, because cosine y can range between negative 1 and 1, u is ranging over negative root 2 to root 2. So now we have our absolute value of a function represented in terms of a rational expression in a variable with particular bounds. Well, let f of u be that expression, which is written right here. So our goal then is to minimize the absolute value of f of u in the range where u goes between root negative 2, the negative of it, uh, the negative of root 2, all the way to root 2. And we can simplify the expression f of u even more by clearing the denominators and then noticing that if we group the last two fractions together, we'll actually get a common factor that factors out with the thing of the denominator. We get u plus twice the quantity 1 plus u all over u squared minus 1. There's a 1 plus u factor in the denominator, so we get u plus 2 all over u minus 1. Excellent. This is really a fantastic thing to notice. We've, we're now minimizing the absolute value of a really simple looking expression over a reasonable range. Okay, so to analyze this, we'll look for local minima and then think about the uh, bounds and what we can plug in. So f prime of u is one minus two times, all over the quantity u minus one squared. And the derivative, setting it to zero, will imply that one is two over u minus one all squared, and so the quantity u minus 1 squared will equal 2, which will mean u is plus or minus the square root of 2 plus 1. But u has to be between negative square root 2 and square root 2, so we can actually omit the 1 plus root 2 choice because it's outside of the bounds that we have. And so when we're looking at the actual place where the derivative is 0, the only place that we care about is when u is actually 1 minus the square root of 2. Okay, so we have our function f, which is u plus 2 over u minus 1. If you plug in root 2, you'll actually get 3 root 2 plus 2. And if you plug in negative root 2, you'll get negative 3 root 2 plus 2. We can evaluate these to, to see that that's the case. We're trying to minimize absolute value of f of c over the interval negative root 2 to root 2. Let's look at the value of f at that critical point that we're, in, we're interested in looking at. So that is going to be 1 minus root 2 plus 2 over the square root of negative 2, which is 1 minus root 2 minus root 2, and that's 1 minus 2 root 2. Okay, so we know our function at the bounds, and we also know what its value is at a critical point, but we're looking at this absolute value of it, so we need to be careful about what we're going to do. So to get a sense of what this looks like, let's actually take a second derivative to get a sense of what the graph looks like. So the second derivative will look like 4 over the quantity u minus 1 all cubed. And so if we use the information we have to actually graph, the function will look something like the following. We'll have a curve that has the concavity informed by that 
second derivative with an asymptote at x equals 1. So we'll have like a hump like that over here, and then another one like this. Okay, and our point 1 minus 2 root 2 is somewhere like over here. So if we actually compute the absolute values here and minimize, the minimum is going to actually occur at this 1 minus root 2 point. And its value is going to be this 2 times the square root of 2 minus 1. Now I need your help to make this rigorous. Why does this actually work? Can you complete this problem with all of this information to get a sense of why we actually have the minimum being 2 root 2 minus 1? Think about the values 3 root 2 plus 2 and negative 3 root 2 plus 2, which are the values at these endpoints of our closed interval, negative root 2 and root 2. And then thinking about, think about the actual information we have about the first and second derivative to analyze the function itself. Leave your thoughts in the comments to finish off the rigorous understanding of why this actually works. So a cool Putnam problem where we start off with a trigonometric expression and reduce it down to minimizing an actual rational function over a closed interval.